Good morning, and welcome to City Clubs Missoula's February Forum, Navigating the Energy Transition. I'm Julie Maloney, and I have the privilege of serving as the chair of the City of Missoula's, City Club Missoula's Board of Directors. Thank you all for being here today. City Club's mission is to bring people together to inform and inspire them on issues vital to the community through public forums that encourage the discussion of new ideas and the free exchange of thought. We have a deep commitment to civility and civil discourse, even when we discuss challenging issues. Before introdu introductions, some thank yous. Thanks to Missoula Community Access Television, which records our forums as part of their media assistance grant to nonprofit organizations. MCAT serves our community on cable channels 189 and 190. MCAT occasionally live streams our forums on its local live platform as well. You can also find videos of past CCM forums by clicking the video button on our website, cityclubmissoula.com. <clears throat> Thanks to our sponsors, in particular those at the executive level. They are the University of Montana, Blackfoot Communications, and First Security Bank. Our executive level sponsors are key partners in helping to expand audience access and reliably planning and conducting our forums. We're grateful to all of our sponsors and we invite you to join them by going to our website. And of course, thanks to our board of directors and our administrator, Danny Howitt. City Club Missoula would also like to acknowledge that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today, we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. Our moderator for today's panel is Robert Scheidenschwartz, President Emeritus of the Montana World Affairs Council Robert earned his BA in political science at the University of Montana. Professionally, Robert began as a registered representative at IDS Financial Services in 1982. <clears throat> in the spring of 1987, he left to become one of the founders of the firm S.G. Long & Company. He is a licensed financial advisor specializing in retirement and estate planning for individuals and businesses. <clears throat> in addition to his professional responsibilities, Robert is an active and high profile supporter of business and citizen education on numerous global education initiatives and business development relationships. Robert served as president of the Montana World Affairs Council for 13 years and now serves as president emeritus. <clears throat> His vision of a critical thinking and informed electorate led to several educational programs that have become institutionalized statewide for the council. Most recently, <clears throat> EconoQuest, which focus on, focuses on civic and economic literacy. He has helped advocate programs such as the nationally recognized World Quest competition, which brings high school students from the cities and towns of Montana to compete in a global education quiz. Other programs include Council in the Classroom and Distinguished Speaker Series. Robert created and hosts MWAC's Council on the Radio program, which reaches over 25,000 viewers per program and he's conducted over 400 interviews of world-class leaders in their represent respective fields. <clears throat> As a vid visiting scholar at Central and Southwest Asian Studies at the University of Montana, Robert co-hosts the University of Montana Brown Bay Luncheon with Dr. Hia, director of the Institute. Robert is a frequent speaker at local community organizations on geopolitical issues with unique insights into global energy markets and their economic consequences. His work has included monthly briefings on international financial and energy matters to various US intelligence agencies. Robert has participated in numerous public events, serving as a moderator on a series of wide ranging topics, adding to his experience and ex expertise on economic and geopolitical issues. Robert will introduce our panelists and I will see you all at the break, roughly around 1220, at which point we will begin table talk which I'll explain later, and then open the forum to questions from the audience. Over to you, Robert. Uh, thank you, and I would have shortened the bio so we can just get to on the moderator to introduce our guests here today. Because we've got a very important, and as I say, a mile wide and a mile deep conversation on one of the more critical issues of our time. So without further ado, uh, to my left, Brian Lipscomb, an enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, and has spent his career of over 30 years managing resources and has been the CEO at the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes Independent Power Producer, responsible for operating and maintaining 
and my apologies, I cannot pronounce uh, the native. You'll get it, all right. In 2021, Brian was uh, appointed the U.S. Department of Energy's Electricity Advisory Committee by Secretary Granholm. EKI participates in the wholesale electricity and natural gas markets across the West. Brian's career path includes time with the U.S. Forest Service, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, and as the Executive Director of the Columbia Basin Fish and Wildlife Authority. His most, excuse me, his most enjoyed work has always been associated with the hydropower system of the Columbia Basin, especially the project. His degree in civil engineering from Montana State University has served him well in his passion. Brian and his wife, Allison, of 38 years, enjoy spending time with their two grown sons and their families. Hunting, fishing, skiing, and camping are the favorite activities of the Lipscomb family. But bottom line, any time with their three grandchildren is their favorite time. So welcome, Brian. Thanks, and, and thank you all for uh, having me here. Um, interesting conversation. I always tell people I could talk for three minutes or three hours about all this, so I'll try to give you the 15-minute version today, enough to get some conversation started and then see where we go. I uh, appreciate you recognizing the homelands uh, of the Salish and uh, Kalispell people. Um, right here was the confluence, of course, uh, Rattlesnake Creek and the Clark's Fork. Uh, I won't pronounce the name. I did have it on the tip of my tongue when I was the Fish and Wildlife Manager, but it is the place of the small spotted trout or where the smaller version of the ad fluvial um, bull trout spawned. And then just upstream uh, is the place of the large spotted trout where the larger ones uh, spawned and the tribes harvested them right at the confluence of the Blackfoot and the Clark's Fork. So, Appreciate you having us here uh, today and me having the opportunity to share some of our thoughts and perspectives. As um, Bob indicated in my introduction, uh, I've been in and around this energy business for three, going on three decades uh, or a little longer, which causes me to pause every once in a while. Uh, and I was reminded a while back when I was sitting across the table from one of our true elders and he looked at me and said, Brian, how old are you? And I said, oh, I'm getting about close to 60. He says, oh, you're a junior elder. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I try not to feel that way, but I'm afraid it's coming. So I'll talk to you a little bit today uh, about the energy transition and some of the challenges facing us. And I'll try to have the conversation from three perspectives. What's happening with loads? What's happening with our systems? And what are the business models now versus what should they be in the future? And what's our, all of that look like now versus sometime in the future? So I'll try to paint the picture locally or somewhat locally, state of Montana, the region, and then nationwide, what that means. Um, and then um, try to weave our way through all of that. So uh, I'll jump right in. So let's talk a little bit about current situation. So we're faced in a, with a situation where we have some challenges in front of us to change how we generate electricity or try to overall reduce our carbon footprint. And there's really three places to look at doing that. It's home heating, transportation, and electricity generation. And if you change transportation and home heating to electri electrify them, to create no carbon footprint, then that puts a different, paints a different picture for the electrical system. And so all of those need to be taken into account. So right now, if you look across the Northwest, we're in quite a good situation. We've been uh, fortunate from this perspective to have the hydropower be a big part of our electricity supply here in the Northwest. So, for example, if you are a customer of Missoula Electric Co-op or Ravalli Electric Co-op or, like me, Mission Valley Power, we get our power from the Bonneville Power Administration. It is 99% renewable, no carbon footprint. There's a little bit of uh, thermal mixed in there, but by and large, it all comes from the dams and the nuclear plant at Hanford. That's where electricity comes from. If you're a Northwestern Energy customer here in Missoula proper, you're still better off than most of the country. You have better than half your electricity coming from hydro. Um, Thompson Falls being the largest of their fleet and then the rest of the dams and the Missouri system being the rest of their fleet. 
So that's the current situation that we find ourselves in here in the Northwest. Um, before I get too much farther along, though, I want to explain a little bit about business models. You heard Bob say that energy keepers operating the Salish Kasanka Kalispell, and so that last word is just Kalispell without the L on the end, so Kalispell. So, and that's the, the name of our tribes. So the Salish, of course, the Bitterroot Salish, the Kalispell being the, the river people and the lake people, and then uh, the Kasanka is the band of Kootenays that are on our reservation. So <clears throat> we're, we're set up as an independent power producer. And when you think about us, we operate our generator, bringing our electricity into the wholesale power market. And we serve most of the Montana industrial customers or those customers that buy their electricity from the wholesale market. There are some utilities that do that, Beartooth Rural Electric, for example. They're not a Bonneville Power customer. They're a Montana wholesale customer, and we serve them. We serve some loads in the city of Great Falls. We serve some large industrial loads, including mines, Phillips 66 refinery, Emery's talc. Um, those, types of cust those types of industries are those that we serve in Montana. And then we also bring electricity uh, to markets across the West. So there are times when we can bring electricity from our dam all the way down to Las Vegas, Nevada, for example, and sell it to MGM Grant. Um, we also are a uh, provider of electricity, specified source electricity, to Puget Sound Energy in Seattle. So uh, as such then, it gives us exposure to all of the wholesale markets across the West. Trading electricity in the West and gas, which drives that electricity price, and by gas I mean natural gas, and the reason it drives it is because natural gas plants are the easy ones to turn off and turn on when, when needed, and so the natural gas price will set the price for the wholesale electric market. So in addition, though, in the Northwest, you need to understand hydro hydrology and what's going on with the hydro system. It's 70% of the market, after all. And what's going on with wind, and what's going on with solar, and what's going on with loads. And we deal in all of that within the context of, just like in every other commodity, um, the intercontinental exchange. Every node is a commodities trading hub or trading point where we trade financial gas and or power as well. So we do all of that within Energy Keeper. So we sell our power physically, we buy and sell physical power across the West, and then we trade financial power and natural gas positions. So we're looking at all of the context of the marketplace. Uh, we've been fairly successful at Energy Keepers. Um, I'm happy to say that as a Section 17, one of the Section 17 corporations of the tribes, we've been able to provide revenue back to the tribal government, our sole shareholder. We don't tax as a tribal government, so our corporations provide the revenue for the tribal government to provide services. So as such, in the seven years that we've operated, we're just over $173 million back to the tribe. In addition, they've recognized, the tribe has, that we're in a unique situation. We have a great asset. It's part of the future for renewable energy. What can we do as a tribally owned corporation to help along this transition of the energy sector? And so as such, we retain some of our earnings to also position ourselves to acquire and build out additional assets as the region and nation are looking at this transition. So that's the world we operate from, and that's the perspective I'll be talking from. So you heard a little bit about systems. Um, the basis of those systems, of course, we all need to keep in mind how they were built. They were, all came to us in the 1930-ish time frame. Um, and at the time, of course, we didn't, nobody realized they needed electricity. In fact, when Bonneville Power uh, first started building Bonneville Dam, they had to drive around the region and convince everybody they needed electricity. <laughs> so, and it's, I was reminded of that the other day watching the, the Yellowstone prequel 1923 and they're in the downtown streets of Bozeman um, and they're walking down Main Street, which they actually did a good job making it look like Bozeman. <laughs> and here's a guy selling an electric wash machine. And everybody looked at that and said, do I need that? <laughs> 
So that's the, in, the context of when a lot of this infrastructure was built. Our dam was built in that era as well. Our dam and the Bonneville Dam were the first two on the entire Columbia system that came into existence. Okay, take that back. Thompson Falls was right before ours a few years because they brought power up to help construct our facility from Thompson Falls. But by and large, we were the first two large facilities on the system. And at that time, our facility was built with the sole purpose of providing electricity to the Anaconda Copper Company's smelter in Anaconda. So as such, it had a transmission line that went directly from our dam to Anaconda. And it's still in place today. That's part of the system. It was built by Montana Power Company, which was an investor-owned utility, which that model was just being promoted at the time. It's a really interesting history that I never thought I'd have to know about the energy business, but the, the whole concept of, yeah, let's create a monopoly and let's create a regulatory aspect to those monopolies, allow those monopolies to be able to collect from customers a mandated amount of money every month to provide this service that they don't think they need in order to pay for this giant infrastructure that this country needs to prosper and grow. So that's the, that's the basis of the structure of the lion's share of our infrastructure across the United States for energy. And that business model that I just described is one that you need to keep in mind. There are three distinct business models within this arena. The business model of an investor-owned utility. It's a for-profit utility. Northwestern is an example. Avist is an example. Puget Sound is an example. There are several all across the country. And they are structured as for-profit entities so they can go to the market and get investment and invest it in large infrastructure and then get a long-term payoff for that. And so their only means of profit is return on their investment, which means return on how much they have invested in large infrastructure. They get a return on that. In Montana, it's 9.5-ish percent for Northwestern Energy. That's set by the Public Service Commission. The other types of business models within this are not for profit. So you have rural electric co-ops. Again, it's based on a monopoly. They serve customers. They're not for profit, so their mandate is to get electricity most reliable and cheapest to their customers. And the rates then are set and controlled by an elected board, Missoula Electric Co-op Board, for example. In the case of Mission Valley Power, it's appointed board by the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. All the other rural electrics have an elected board that gives the public then access to say what the rates are. The public's access to the rates for the investor-owned utilities is the Public Service Commission. The last model, which we are, are independent power producers in the wholesale market, which did not exist until the year 2000-ish about. So it's fairly young. And you might all recall Montana Power Company, Northwestern's predecessor, was part of the deregulation in Montana that brought about the opportunity for wholesale power markets to exist in the state and for those customers that are now served in that arena to elect to go that route. So those are the business models that you have in place. So as we look to the future and we look to changing out where we ultimately end up, it's the removal of coal and natural gas out of our generation and replacing it with something. So that comes twofold. There's two parts to that equation. One is the supply, the other is the load. I'm going to take a little foray for a second and talk about load. Load is our houses, our businesses. Up until now, all of those have been a load, meaning you turn on the light and the power comes to you. We are quickly moving to a situation, though, where we have a choice. And we can put solar on our roofs batteries in our walls and in our basements, fuel cells in our garage, a couple of vehicles with batteries, and all of a sudden your load isn't just strictly a load. It can go both ways. And it absolutely changes the dynamic then of what our future is. In order for that, all of those systems within that house then to work together, they ought to talk to each other. And then in all order for all of that 
to work together with your neighbor, they also need to talk to each other through a bunch of systems built around systems. Right now, there is no standardization for that. That is a future that I think is going to be real. There are some communities that actually do that now. I just read an article in the industry press, um, a community down in Florida, when the last hurricane went through there last fall, it was the only community that was left standing afterwards. They had a professional, ex-professional football player, I think, that funded everything. They rebuilt all of their infrastructure, put it all underground, and had it all off-grid. Absolutely doable in Florida. Not absolutely doable in Montana. We just, Energy Keepers just now is doing a design potential for a casino on the reservation. Can we do this off-grid? Off it's a small load, one megawatt. We generate a gigawatt at the dam, by the way. So it's one megawatt of load. In order for us to accommodate that and have it run 24-7, you got to think December 21st. We get about two and a half hours of sunshine that will generate electricity with a photovoltaic panel. So you need, okay, enough batteries to run it the other 22 and a half hours, or 21 and a half hours, sorry, my math was off. So you go, okay, how many batteries does that take? And then how many more solar panels do you need to charge that bank of batteries in two and a half hours? And all of a sudden you have a footprint for a solar field that's pushing a couple hundred acres and ginormous batteries. And you do all the math on that and you go, this doesn't quite work yet, but it's coming. I think it's coming. Um, and then you look at one step further and you look at, well, what did they use for heating? Well, they used air source heat pumps and everybody's saying those are the, the next greatest thing. And I know for a fact those don't work when it's 20 degrees outside. And if it's 10 degrees outside, you better wear your down coat. Our kids, grandkids got to play basketball in the Boys and Girls Club in Ronan when it was 10 degrees and they have a heat pump. And no kidding, it was about 50 in that gym. And if you didn't have a down coat on, you weren't staying. <laughs> so the point of all that is, as we look to the future, we need to be thinking about what are the systems that are going to work? And what's going to be our backup? I know for me, my backup is a wood stove. You all can't have one here in Missoula. And every chance I get, I say, you all ought to rethink that. I was here when you shut it down the first time and was cheering it on, thought it was a great idea. Today is a different world. My wood stove, you, I will defy you to see smoke coming out of my chimney because it is so efficient. And I hardly, I do, not, I do not burn a quart of wood a year. And it'll combine with the uh, in-floor heating, heated by a hot water heater, electric, never get cold and never have to burn too much wood. And then when I look at what climate change is doing to the forest, I go, holy smokes. There's a lot of fuel out here. So some things to think through. All of what I just described is a system that works at a local level. Small infrastructure, some complications to that. We have business models that don't accommodate that very well. So a rural electric co-op, sure, you can talk to the board and you say, okay, you do a net metering where you buy back and forth the power. Okay, that all gets set up. Got to recognize, though, that some people can't afford that. So are they paying more for the rest of the system than those who, who can afford to put the new technology on or take it on? All questions that we have to stare down and not ignore. The other is the large infrastructure model, getting a return on investment. There are states in this country that are already moving away from that model for their investor-owned utilities because they recognize that that model doesn't align with a potential future that does not have as much large infrastructure as we currently have. If you don't address it, those large utilities, investor-owned, could go out of business. We've been through that in Montana. I don't think we want it to happen again. <laughs> so I think with all of that, requires us then to ask the question, what's the right business structure? And there are models out there where they're looking at it and implementing it. The state of Hawaii, for example. There, all the islands except for the island of Kauai are served by Hawaii Electric. And that, 
the business model for Hawaii Electric has now been adjusted by the state of Hawaii. So regulatorily, they make a profit based on providing electricity that the customers want economically, not based on return on their infrastructure. So it's a different model. Time will tell whether or not it will work. But there's other states and other regulatory entities that are doing the same thing across the country. So it's all happening. So um, that's kind of a quick picture of how I see things needing to change. We've got a current large bunch of infrastructure over here that's going to migrate to something over here that's going to have different loads and different supplies. And it's, it's not going to be the same. And we have to be able to restructure things to accommodate this new world over here. And it's not going to be quick and it's not going to be easy. So uh, it will challenge us all as we think about it. Because, you know, you, you hear people just hear the, see the debate all the time. Northwestern Energy saying, hey, coal strips going away. We absolutely have to have capacity to back up all the solar and wind that's coming onto our system. We'll just build more solar and wind. Well, wait a second. That doesn't solve the problem. The wind doesn't blow 24-7 and the sun doesn't shine 24-7. So capacity means what do you have that's available when nothing else is available? And is it at a local level or is it at a larger level? Not to mention all of the potential systems inside of our houses that might change as well. So I'll leave you with that. Uh, hopefully it's given you enough to think about, and obviously I'll look forward to questions at the end and turn it over to Brad. Brian, thank you. I'm going to introduce uh, Bradley and hope you're thinking about this. Is, it's not a one-dimensional chess game, is it? It's a 3D oh, chess game. So when you're thinking about this, you have to be able to function on multiple levels because of the complexity of these issues. So thank you. Outstanding. So I want to introduce Bradley Layton, and we will try to be true to our time because then you go to your tables come up with your questions and that's what then spurs the conversation as we start closing out uh, uh, our presentation and our discussion today. So Bradley Layton was born in the small town of Seymour, Indiana, home of John Cougar Mellencamp, Little Pink Houses and Jack and Diane. And for those who don't know, he's also an accomplished artist. That's Mellencamp, not Bradley. <laughs> Leaving behind his Hoosier homeland, Leighton entered MIT, which is not Missoula Institute of Technology. That's the Massachusetts Institute of uh, Technology as an undergrad, where he earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering under bicycling science author Professor David Gordon Wilson. While at MIT, Leighton would row with a nearby perfect record over over 30 losses on MIT's rowing team. <laughs> yeah. Did I read that right? Whatever happened to, if you're not first, you're last. <laughs> Determined to salvage his poor legacy, Leighton pursued his seat on the US state, United States rowing team, where he competed internationally from 1993 to 1997 while holding engineering positions in Washington, DC, Augusta, or August, Georgia, and Alexandria, Virginia. After this test of his physical limitations, uh, Leighton then enrolled in a doctoral program at University of Michigan to test his mental limits where he earned a PhD in biomedical engineering with a dissertation focused on the mechanical properties of diabetic peripheral nerve. When did you find time to enjoy yourself, Brad? This is, this is heady stuff. Dr. Layton then joined the Mechanical Engineering and Mechanics Facility at Drexel University in Philadelphia, where he continued his research into the fields such as nanobiometric, bi, nanobiomechanics and protein evolution. While at Drexel Layton, um, had many students who were eager to pursue engineering challenges such as building solar cars, wind turbines, and other renewable energy technologies. This common interest promoted, excuse me, prompted Leighton to take a deep dive into the United States global energy policies, which resulted in the 2008 paper and a series of email exchanges with Jared Diamond and a passion for renewable energy technology. This passion led Leighton, the Missoula, led Leighton the Missoula College in 2010 where he accepted the position of director at the University of Montana's recently established energy technology program. The program boasts 80 graduates and over 500 individuals who completed energy technology program courses. Layton is now a licensed professional engineer and expert witness with several Montana-based LLCs pursuing manufacturing and waste to energy opportunities in the circular energy economy, excuse me, sector. He also, just for your edification, 
has a book, Zero Waste, in the last best place, and peer-reviewed papers, which are out on the desk um, as you would be exiting. There's also a QI code for those who would like to have or get access to the book, as well as these peer-reviewed papers. So, Brad, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Bob. Thanks for having me. Uh, I, I think since I've got my slides, I'm just going to try to stand down here and hopefully so I can just see my own slides better and, and click through them. So I've got three, just like um, Brian's three business models, I've got three questions for you that we're going to try to answer. So the first one is, is energy the same as power? I think the, the two terms are used interchangeably. I'm going to try to convince you that there, there is a difference, and that's what Brian was referring to as, as capacity and, and load, basically. So we'll get into that. And so there's uh, my analogy, like in your stomach, this is energy uh, stored right here. And then in a, in a tribute to the dam, uh, that's flowing. That's power. So that's energy in motion. So they're, they're, one involves time, and the other one is just is stored capacity. The second one, this is a little more abstract, but maybe at Bob's alley we can discuss this later, is, is money real? And, well, it's just, just kind of fun. It's City Club, so we'll have some fun with that. Yeah. Uh, and then the third one, and I think Brian mentioned this too when he was talking about these so-called smart grids, is information the new currency? So uh, those, are, those are my three questions that I want to try to uh, address as we move, move through this. So... Um, as you might have guessed, energy is not power. What's the relationship between the two? I've tried to give a graphic, and typically we see time flowing on that horizontal axis, power on the vertical, and so energy is just power times time. So uh, Brian mentioned megawatts. If that dam runs for one megawatt for one hour, that's one megawatt hour. A gigawatt is a, is, um, a thousand times that great. And that's, um, you know, for example, what, what coal strip is... Well, depending on the time of day, one to, one to two gigawatts. Or you can add it up this way. This is your electricity bill each month. You know, each month you certain, uh, consume a certain amount of kilowatt hours. Add those up. That little sigma sign is, a, is an addition. Add them up, and that's your, your total energy. Another way to think about it is, as, as he was saying earlier, that two and a half hours on December, for example, there's just, that's going to be a little bit of, of a blip. Uh, but you can just take that blip, integrate it over time, at your power, and that's your total energy. So that's the, real, that's the mathematical relationship between energy and power. So when you're looking at your power bill, oh, what's a kilowatt, what's a kilowatt hour? Kilowatt is how fast it's moving through your system, and the kilowatt is the sum of everything that, that came through it. So that's the, um, the first one. And now I want to give an analogy between energy and money. So I've got this little story. I used to tell it to the high school students when I'd give lectures. Uncle Helios and Aunt Tara. So here's Uncle Helios. And Uncle Helios is going to give you a dollar for every minute. Um, he, he's your benefactor. So a buck a minute for your whole life. And you're going to live to be 100 years old. So the question is, when do you get to retire? So I want to make that, so that's an easy analogy for, you know, just money, you can think of that. But now let's think of that in terms of energy. So Uncle Helios is the sun, and he's been shining on Aunt Terra, the Earth, for four and a half billion years, three, three billion of which was, was life, photosynthesis happening. So again, you're going to get a, a buck a minute for 100 years. When do you get to retire if this is your energy that you're going to consume, the, the fossil fuels that we've been talking about, gas, oil, coal. Um, any guesses? 70, 80, 90 maybe? Well, if you do the math on this problem, when do you get to retire? So there's 50 million minutes in a 100-year in a lifespan. Uh, we've, as I said, there's been 3 billion years of photosynthesis. Um, we're on pace to extract all of the fossil fuels from our planet in about 300 years. We're about halfway through it, approximately. So there's your 300 years. There's your 3 billion years. Divide those. It's a, it's a 1 to 10 million ratio. There's your whole 50 million minute life. So five minutes. <laughs> 
That's your retirement party right before you die at the end. Of it. So that's, those are the ratios, and I think it's sometimes hard to wrap our heads around those scales. But Brian was saying, yeah, we've only had electricity for, you know, not even 200 years yet. So that, that's, uh, that's the perspective I, I try to put on, on this type of thing. So um, if you get a chance, I hope you can read this paper I brought with me, Shramsky et al., uh, 2015, sitting out front. In there, they, they make a similar analogy where the Earth is a chemical battery, the chemicals being the fossil fuels that, that we're extracting, humanity basically leaving the lights on, or you know, all the other loads that you know, Brian was mentioning too with, with uh, transportation, buildings, sectors, manufacturing, et cetera. And so if, if you plot that over time, what, what you can see here is uh, the, the red line is the rate of total energy consumption so we already mentioned megawatts, gigawatts. Total global consumption is 16 terawatts. So another, so it's um, 2,000 coal strips. Uh, you know, approximately is, is what we've got on planet Earth. You can see the global population there in blue. The green line is the relationship between the two. So in a sense, we've sort of peaked in terms of the number of amount of energy per person and. The, and if you, if you do the math, each, uh, the average person on the planet has about t the equivalent of 20 people working for them all the time. So that we, we've always got about 2,000 watts out there working on our behalf. If we add up the car, the, the house, et cetera, et cetera, we've got about 20, I, I call them techno slaves, if you will, of, of human power. That's on average. North Americans consume energy six times the global average. So, so we've got um, 120, uh, the equivalent of 120 people working. So that's the, that's the ratio. And if you do the math on that, this is the rate at which we've depleted Earth's carbon battery. So the, this chart's a little bit hard to read or interpret, but the, it's, it's basically years per year. So if you go back 2,000 years, Look at the rate of energy consumption. At that rate, we had, do I have a, uh, right there. Uh, at that rate, we had 70,000 years of fossil fuel hydrocarbons left. As that rate accelerated over time, the number of years that we have left diminished. And so now we're you know, well under 1,000 years if you, if, you, if you run those numbers forward. And the conclusion that Shramsky et al. run is that we're basically driving our planet towards a thermal equilibrium state, you know, basically we're gonna look like the moon or Mars if, if we keep at it. And so, and he makes a lot of thermodynamic equilibrium. So again, I, I uh, encourage you to read that uh, paper. I just showed some of the, some of the uh, excerpts from it. And there's a URL there too. And if, if the slides are available, you can just click that and, and go to it. So, you know, for, for someone to claim, well, you know, the Earth, the earth is only 6,000 years old or something like that, uh, we're sitting at the bottom of a, a lake bed that's hundreds of thousands of years old, and I challenge someone to make the opposite argument with me. And I, a lot of this talk, I actually used um, chat GPT to write some of this stuff. I don't know if you've seen it, but I was trying to think of some kind of clever challenge uh, to someone who might claim that the Earth is a lot younger than it is, you know, an analogy would be if if um, if this were true, it'd be like arguing that the you know the moon that the sun is about the size of Mount Jumbo, about one cubic mile. It rises in in Butte and and sets in um, sets in Coeur d'Alene. I mean, that's that's about if you <laughs> run those numbers. So anyway, we'll skip that. Um, so my, my next, um, next point I want to make, so that was the, you know, the difference between energy and power, and, and hopefully you get a, a feel of the, of the rates at which humanity is, is draining the amount of energy on the planet due to the, the power that flows through our global civilization. So um, my next argument is that there is no money. Sorry, Bob, but I'll, I'll prove this. So if, if I buy something and, and give someone a dollar, I have negative one dollars. Uh, the person I give that dollar to has plus one dollars now. So uh, checking my math here, if I have minus one, plus one, it's zero. So there's no money. Um, most of the money we 
use or have, it's not that it doesn't flow. So it's, it's a little bit like the difference between energy and power. It's certainly flowing around, just like alternating current. The other amazing thing about alternating current is as it's flowing back and forth through power lines, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, it actually doesn't go anywhere. It's not going in a, in a circle like through a battery. It's just sort of sloshing back and forth, and we're sort of catching those waves as it comes in and out of the, uh, out of the wall. So it's uh, a little bit of analogy there. Um, I like to think money more of, as like a lubricant. It just allows things that wouldn't happen through bartering to happen faster. So, uh, or money is an accelerant. And again, this was generated by chat GPT. If you haven't used it, it's kind of wild. You just type something in, boom, there's your, there's your art. Um, to check on some of these numbers, I, I usually go to worldometers, meters And so there's um, current world population. If you go to the, the site in real time, you'll, you'll see these sort of flying. One minute, two minutes, one minute, okay. And I'll just, I'm going to wrap up with, this, with, the, with the money part. Um, you can also see the uh, rate of expenditures. And then also, this is a great resource for looking at the um, rate at which um, energy is being diminished. So I already mentioned this part about the relationship between money and electricity. And then finally, I'm just going to leave it at this, that information is the new currency. So thanks for coming to City Talk and um, City Club. City, City Club. Club. <laughs> and uh, and be being informed. So thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Now it's Table Talk, which is a very rich part of every City Club forum. And it's arguably the gist of why we're here. We'll take about five minutes for each table to come up with a question related to the presentations to ask the panel. Afterwards, we'll have somebody with a mic come around and you can ask your questions. See you in five minutes. All right. As I said in the beginning, we are committed to civil discourse, so we ask that you keep your questions respectful and that you avoid making statements. We also ask that any members of the media save their questions until after the forum. Our panelists should be able to stick around after the forum ends. When asking your question, please be sure to stand up, introduce yourself, avoid statements, and ask one question. We have two people with microphones that will come to your table to have you ask your questions. Please raise your hand to let them know that you have a question. Thank you. My name is Scott, and I've been designated to ask the question to either person, is the acquisition of Cold Strip by Northwest Energy make sense economically or environmentally? So um, I don't know the ins and outs of the deal enough to speak to whether or not it makes sense uh, from either perspective. However, thinking about coal strip and for us in Montana, we should be asking ourselves, what's the glide path for that facility and how does it go out smoothly without causing problems for us here in Montana for us to take care of? So uh, that's the, the bigger question, I think, is how does it work into the future uh, from the standpoint of taking care of coal strip and the town of Coal Strip, cleaning up what's left from Coal Strip, and then also, not to be overlooked, how do you replace the tax revenue from Coal Strip for the state of Montana, for all of us that live here? Provides support for infrastructure and services. How does that get replaced? You can't ignore those things. So those are the questions, I think, to be asked and answered. From a Northwestern's perspective, and being a customer of Northwestern, if I was living in Missoula, I'd be asking the question of how do I assure that as Northwestern supply transitions from what it is now to something in the future that's less reliable, less capacity, are they structuring their supply to accommodate what we want as customers going into the future? 
And also really quick on that, there are models for turning that into a geothermal facility. There's also, um, we, we got a, one of my companies got a Department of Energy grant a few years ago to actually extract rare earth metals from those ponds. There's, a, there's about a billion dollars worth of aluminum alone in, in one of those ponds that has to be moved. Uh, we, and we turned that into a private contract as well. So that's another, you know, in terms of addressing the, uh, the, the tax base too. So hopefully that's something that will happen and continue to develop. I will, I will just uh, briefly add to this, just broadening this out a little bit as a geopolitical issue. We know and very familiar with the term resiliency, energy res resiliency in terms of systems. The event that led to Russia invading Ukraine caused major disruption, which Europe is going through right now. They are reevaluating the entire relationship and their energy systems. So before you maybe get rid of something, you need to think of not only from a national security perspective, but to Brian's point earlier about the resiliency portion of it as well. Um, my name's Lars, and I have a question. Um, so in terms of both economic and energy efficiency, what is the most efficient way to store energy? Is it in a battery at somebody's house or a water battery for 500 people? Which is better? I'd say it's a lake. <laughs> I would absolutely agree. Storing energy with water is by far the most efficient. It's also the oldest, and it gets the least amount of attention today. <laughs> yeah, and the, the Gordon Butte project is, a, is, I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but it's um, similar scale, and the idea is, uh, is to pump water uphill onto a geological feature that's impermeable to water while you've got excess wind, excess sun, et cetera, and then that run that back downhill. And the, the current project is... Um, I think it's, it's about a half a gigawatt, uh, so about, about the same size as Kerr Dam, some, something that would, would do that, you know, in terms of efficiency and, and not having to mine for battery materials, et cetera. Best way to go, in my opinion, too. It's on. Good, thanks. Hi, David Lowenwater. Um, I have... Uh, I guess a culmination of one question as a result of a couple, um, which essentially is in looking at the increased demand for electric vehicles and other electrical components, and as a side note, when I was a kid, I hated the idea of batteries, 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 and it's just blown out of proportion. Our lives just can't avoid those at this point. Those are certainly types of electrical energy. Uh, how do we keep energy sustainable? Um, into the near future until we can find a better solution to those productions. So I, I heard an assumption in there. Right at the beginning, you had an assumption. What was that? The increased use of yeah, energy. Yeah, increased use. I, I, I'm not sold yet that we're going to have an increased use or an increased demand. Think about the home that I described. I think our demand is absolutely going to be different. Is it going to be more? I don't know. It might be less. What if we had a system inside of our home that was completely direct current, DC, all ran off of batteries. You had some solar panels on your roof. You had systems that were designed to work when the sun shined and went to sleep when the sun didn't shine, and you had enough battery capacity to get you through the night. So a freezer that comes on at during the day, it goes off at night. Your refrigerator, the same thing. Your water heater, the same thing. Instead of taking a shower first thing in the morning, we take a shower first thing in the afternoon when we get home. So all of that could combine to a completely different load structure. And then you take all of those and you start to combine them in what's called distributed energy systems, so they call them DERs. And then you have all of those distributed out and you can start to calculate when is it a load versus when is it a supply? And it becomes what's called in the industry a virtual power plant where it becomes dispatchable. And our life systems are different as well. So for example, three years ago now, I drove to work every day. I don't anymore. And so I drive a lot less in fact, I almost asked, can I do this by Zoom? 
I just wasted up and down the road in a whole day. And it's not a waste, sorry, it's this great conversation. But I'm thinking to myself, I could have done that on the screen over there. With a little bit of forethought and a little bit of change in our systems for how we do business. You know, another example, I do board meetings and lots of meetings. And sometimes I do a mix, live and virtual. And my staff equip me with, no kidding, it is a high resolution projector. And I sit it on the table like this and I have a speaker that connects to my cell phone that sounds like a hi-fi stereo. It's like, holy smokes, these people are sitting in a room with me. And it's just touching the surface of how we can change the way we do things. So I wouldn't assume that our life is going to be more load. I will assume that it's going to be different. And for us as a society to wrap our heads around that, I touched on the business part, but we got to think about the systems part of it. You know, I grew up in a time where you went through high school and they taught you how to work on your car or a small engine that was an internal combustion. We didn't spend much time on electricity or some computer systems, but not a whole bunch. Now you'd get more computer systems, but I think the future is you learn how to run all of that stuff in grade school <laughs> so you can come and help grandpa. <laughs> follow up on that just because you brought up a couple of ideas uh, which are akin to cold fusion in the sense that it's not there yet, it's a great idea, we'd like to, we've seen success, but very, very small success. In, in looking at something that's usable and workable now, how do we maintain sustainability? Looking towards knowing that we're going to change in the future, but how do we sustain it now? How do we sustain I, I think flat out what you saw from Brad is is not sustainable now. It is absolutely not. We've got to get to the point where we're tapping something different or we're not going to be sustainable. I think Bob wanted me to try to answer that question. It's, it's um, well, and you also mentioned, I mean, we probably have to bring in climate change into the conversation at some point because I, I, I think we will find that the entropic cost on the environment will overwhelm our current economic models. I, I think that's what we're really starting to see. So, and, and is, is, does everybody see it? No, unfortunately, it just sort of happens in, the, in, these, in these pockets. And, and, and also, unfortunately, a lot of times, the, the, the people who are most effective are the least um, enabled to, to, to make the, the changes that have to happen. So I, well, and yeah, I, th I, think our, I think our energy per capita, as you saw in the Shramsky paper, it has gone down. Is that because there's less energy or is that because there, there are more people? But it's, it's, uh, it will be an interesting interplay between economics and just uh, daily living and, and systems, like Brian was saying. And David, uh, I know we got a question over here, but I want everybody to hear this very carefully. We have seven point something billion people on the planet. We're moving towards 10 billion. That population is not going to be generally in the industrial, sophisticated societies of the West and other developed countries. It's going to be in the developing countries. Their rate of consumption of goods and services is at a different level than where, than we, where, excuse me, where we are at. It's going to go up exponentially because they want the same things that we've enjoyed. And the demand for electricity to meet that is also going to be one of the greater challenges as well. So when you're thinking about this issue, it's got to be a broader issue that doesn't just include, of course, the U.S. and other developed countries. The real challenges will lie in the developing countries. I might argue that. Those might be opportunities. Uh, and I would agree with that. So no, no legacy there. No, in fact, we can leapfrog from where, where, where they are now in terms of what we're able to provide. Um, but, yeah, that's another conversation we can have. All right, question right here. Hi, Erica Sylvester with Clearwater Credit Union. Um, our question is, what are some of the financial benefits to incentivizing people to invest in solar and wind? Those projects are very expensive. So the financial benefits to all of us in Western Montana took a quantum leap forward last August, I think, when they passed the um, Inflation Reduction Act. Within that act, are opportunities for tax credits 
for buying solar or renewable energy sources. And those tax credits, although they've been around for two decades, uh, and I've had to compete against them in the marketplace as a tribal corporation who wasn't afforded that opportunity, they now are available to all non-tax paying entities or to individuals. So I think there's some opportunity there and they were designed with sort of back a napkin, okay, how much do you need to subsidize these resources over here so that there's financial incentive to go down that path and do away with what's over here. To accelerate that and create even more opportunity is you heard me touch on what's called net metering and that's when, okay, I've got a solar panel, say here's my solar panel and in the afternoon it's generating more than I need so it's going back into the system and I'm getting paid for it. And so our local, at the local level, the local market level, which isn't a place I do business and we do business in the wholesale level, but at that local level we need to get to that point where net metering is commonplace and it's structured in a way where you don't leave people behind or you don't burden those who don't have that opportunity to get paid back. So, some thoughts. Can I follow that up? Because the, when you brought up the economics of that and understanding the history of the economics is from a monopolistic perspective, whether it's an investor-owned or nonprofit, by and large, monopolies don't want to give up the monopoly. And so where do you see the Northwesterns or the nonprofits if you have these hybrid models at a residential level or small business level that's, that's doing uh, power generation and taking care of their own load needs and maybe needing to store or whatever that looks like moving into the future? What's the role of those monopolies as it relates to the benefit, it's expensive to get into solar here and think that payback period isn't great and the monopolies don't help that. And so where do you see that going? That gets to the part of the point I was making about our business models. Those business models are by regulation. By regulation, Northwestern gets paid profit on their investment, their investment, not your investment. And they get paid from having to set customers to pay the bill over time. So by regulation, those business models are set up for them to succeed within that business model. So what's the future business model? I don't know. I do know though that there are entities looking at that and asking that question and say, how do we change this structure so that the alignment of what people want is aligned with the business models and the opportunities for companies to provide profit. Because obviously, we all can't afford the transmission lines that are going to move that power line, even at the local level. You know, at last I checked for a large transmission line, it was a million dollars a mile. So we still need monopolies and some form of business structure to accommodate large infrastructure. Or Because I don't see us getting to the point where we can have completely standalone distributed energy systems in Montana unless we have a completely way different lifestyle. Maybe we'll get there, but I don't know if we can. There's a lot of large loads still out there, um, Jason. So, um, yeah, it's going to require us to all roll up and say, how can we do things differently? Well, at the same time, not yanking the rug out from in, under anybody on this. One more thing to keep in mind on that, uh, the USDA uh, REAP grants now at 40%, it was, it was at 25, so along with the federal tax credit of 30, I mean, you can get 70% of most, most uh, tax paying pro uh, projects that are rural paid for. I have a question in here. Hi, I'm Annette Marcia, so I'm with the Missoula Redevelopment Agency. And our table, we had questions all over the board from, um, uh, questions about like sort of future iterations of solar panels that maybe don't need direct sunlight but just daylight. Um, how best do we lobby our legislators? Um, but the, the question that we settled on for our table was um, if, for instance, the city of Missoula wanted to go to a 100% renewable energy system, 
and maybe not a closed loop system, what would that look like for a community like the size of Missoula? If, if we really wanted to go like the city in Florida, that, that resilient, what would that look like for us? I think we, we did the math a few years ago, and just like for the, like if you're gonna run the university, um, for example, totally off grid, you'd need a volume of water about this, the volume of the Mansfield Library at the, at the M, for example. You know, as we talked about, what do you do with storage? And you, know, you, you probably have um, solar panels all along North Hill there, for example. I, I, I could see um, turning that Hellgate Canyon in, into a wind turbine corridor and you know, so, so those would be your, your, your two primary sources. I don't, I don't see, I don't think the, 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 the dam is gonna come back, uh, for example, there at the confluence, but uh, you know, if, you, if you did solar and wind there, and as well as some of the systems, you know, doing, doing some um, thermal storage as well. You know, the university has a, has a pretty cool geothermal system. Uh, but but uh, yeah, you could you could do pumped hydro here. There's enough elevation change to do some pumped hydro storage. That's all viable uh, future thoughts. Some other ones that are cause me to stop and think every once in a while. A little maybe out of the box. Um, hydrogen from electrolysis. Incredibly steal a term from Brad. Dense energy source generate hydrogen from renewables, use that hydrogen then to generate electricity, whether that be for a battery, for a car. I think that's where our transportation system ultimately ends up. I don't think we're there, and the momentum is certainly electric cars with batteries, but it, I think we will get to the point where we realize that batteries might not be the best answer, but hey, Electrolysis with some advancements in technology, getting hydrogen and oxygen, and then turning it back into water might be a better solution in the long run. Our infrastructure is nowhere near ready to handle it, <laughs> but there is some dollars that have been uh, allocated through the infrastructure law to stimulate that conversation. So. I'm not ready to hang my hat on it and say that's where we're going to make an investment and have an, a hydrogen plant, but I, it causes me to pause for a second think about it. The other one that I wouldn't overlook, if they would answer the question of life cycle, is small nuclear reactors. You end up with a nuclear waste less than the size of my cell phone, but it's still nuclear waste. If you took a Navy approach, which I got exposed to through the U USS Montana commissioning, which is another story, but anyway, I talked to the Navy about it. They said, we have a life cycle approach. We know where that piece of plutonium or uranium that's powering our submarine is gonna go to bed. So if we would all take that long-term life cycle look at nuclear, it might be a solution. It's certainly where Bill Gates thinks the solution is He's got access to more money than probably all of us in the room put together times 10, and he has a bunch of smart people working for him, and he's wrote a book called How Do We Avoid the Climate Disaster. It is really interesting. Take a read on that or listen to it, and he's betting on nuclear. I like the hydrogen idea. In fact, that's how the energy technology program at the University of Montana started. Paul Williamson had a, a plan to take um, all of Missoula off the, the carbon grid. He had a sort of a Walt Disney World version of this hydrogen infrastructure here. And I think, you know, a little bit ahead of his time, but I, I still have the 25 kilowatt uh, electrolyzer uh, sitting over at my office, as well as a mining vehicle. If anybody wants to come see those legacy technologies, maybe we'll get some money and, and fire those bad boys up again. All right, we got one more final question right here. Hi, I'm Russ Fletcher. Um, you mentioned the several business models for utilities. Well, I had the pleasure of serving on the advisory board for Northwestern for quite a while. And one of them that we talked about was decoupling. Right now, Northwestern makes all its revenue off of selling energy. That's it. Decoupling means that they can sell energy, but they can also sell all the associated elements 
that go with energy consumption, solar, uh, putting in furnaces, doing all this. Several utilities back east are doing this now very, very successfully. And I'm wondering if you have ideas about how we could encourage Northwestern to think about this, since as an example in electricity, several of the major car companies won't be selling combustion engines after 2025. They're going all electric. And in, like in Texas, you could uh, power your house for three days with your Ford Lightning. Um, things are changing very rapidly, and I, I just don't think Northwestern's really thinking about what's coming forward, although they are putting in microgrids now, which is, uh, I think, the other element here that takes care of the transmission. I, I heard a couple assumptions that I don't know if I tracked. One was the only way at Northwestern makes money is selling electricity. I'd say they collect revenue through the sale of electricity at the local level here, your bill. But the profit that's built into that is return on investment of major infrastructure. That's their profit. Um, could they make more profit? Could profit be structured differently? Absolutely. Are entities doing that across this country? Absolutely. And that's a conversation that I think is ripe to be had across the country. Do I know the answer? I don't yet. I haven't dug into it deep enough. Uh, as an independent power producer, I would continue to argue that having a free market aspect to generation is always needs to be part of the picture going forward. Um, I think I would argue, and many would in the industry, that independent power producers will turn this page quicker than utilities. Uh, so I, I do think that we're a viable part of it. And I also think that we should learn the lessons and understand that the world that Montana Power Company helped create in 2000 isn't the world we live in in uh, wholesale power now. And the reason Northwestern came after is because power prices went through the roof, literally. And they went through the roof because Enron messed with the system. And now we have regulations that prevent that, including some pretty uh, stringent accounting rules that we have to follow. And so the markets are more mature. And so I think markets can help solve this problem. They're not the end all be all, absolutely not. They're part of the solution though. Um, but the real question of motivating Northwestern uh, I don't know, has anybody asked them what a different business model might well look like where they could succeed? Well, and I mean, my thoughts on that uh, in terms of decoupling, and one thing I've seen a little bit of, but and having dealt with other utilities across the country as well that I would like to see more of is just selling efficiency. So, you know, th th then the, um, the utility can last longer, these fossil fuel uh, reserves can last longer, the loads aren't as great, the fluctuations aren't as high. So in terms of decoupling, I, I think it'd be cool to see utilities, you know, selling efficiency, if, if you will. So that brings us to our close. I don't want to, Julie, your final word here. No, 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 thank you. Thank you all for being here. I feel like we could, uh, be here all afternoon having this discussion. Many thanks to our panelists and moderator, Bradley, Brian, and Robert. Um, fascinating topic. Again, thank you to our sponsors, especially the University of Montana, First Security Bank, and Blackfoot Communications. And of course, thank you all for being here. We appreciate your support of City Club Missoula. Our March 13th forum is still a work in progress. Uh, check our Facebook page or website later this week for more information. Thank you and have a great week.